You know, you don't have to be a hog-riding, leather-wearing miscreant to be a rebel. As a matter of fact, most rule breakers and rabble rousers look just like everybody else. So what'd you expect, a roadster? No doubt George Washington was a great leader. But you know, leadership is one of those qualities we either experience every day or not. But what does it take to be a great leader in the field? Harvey Firestone once said that the growth and development of people is really the highest calling of leadership. EcoVet Furniture is the kind of business whose first priority is fostering development and growth in its staff, who are mainly veterans of the armed forces while turning reclaimed goods into beautiful, high-quality pieces. See, I was uh, in the Navy from uh, 2004 to 2011. I'm a current member of the Arkansas Army National Guard. I spent 13 years in the military. If I hadn't been injured, I'd, I'd have probably re you know, fully retired from the military. I'd plan on spending all my life in the military. Started here two years ago and it's been uh, life-changing for me. EcoVet was started in 2011 um, by a father and son team that wanted to give veterans an opportunity to re-enter the workforce, and now my dad, Mike Haygood, run, owns it. And we take semi-trailers that Walmart has decommissioned, and we take them, we tear them down, we use all the wood and metal to make furniture. It's amazing, like there's not people like that at all like um, being able, willing to take the money out of their own pocket because they see other people struggling and you know they may not have served themselves but they see what we're going through at home and people not wanting to give us the opportunity because I mean after some people find out we've deployed they think we're crazy like we're not we're just you know our switches are a little bit different now. Veterans have done a great service for our country. For those that are not veterans, um, like myself and my dad, we feel like we owe it to them. They've put their life on the line and and it's hard for them to come back and enter into civilian world. Sometimes getting a job isn't easy because their credentials from military don't transfer into civilian life very easily. Without programs like this, some of us never find our path again. Like they'll just, just stumble around being you know, an outcast of society. And this is, you know, this is kind of putting us all back together so we're able to find ourselves, we're able to function in society again. With, with the military, it's a, it's a whole nother world. And you get out and you don't find many places that you fit. You know, I happen to find an EcoVet and I fit. And then we have some veterans that just want a place where it's safe, where they don't feel like they have to tell their stories, they don't have to talk about it, and they can just come and do their work and do something and be proud of it, just as they were their time in service. But at the end of the day, when you see the finished product, after ripping it out of the trailer, there's a sense of pride in, in the work. It's not just reclaiming something that normally would have went you know, to the trash, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of like a lot of us old school military guys, you know, they're, instead of just being forgotten about and pushed aside, you know, we're, we're giving it another chance and revamping it into something else and it's kind of like us, you know, they're revamping us into civilian life, so to speak, you know, so. Because you can look at our guys and they come back and don't have anywhere to go. These trailers get decommissioned, don't have anywhere to go, and so we're putting the two things together and it, and it works. Good old water, essential to life, but often taken for granted. Clean water is becoming rarer and rarer. My friend Farmer Tyler stopped by to show us some alternatives for this very real concern. Nice. Harvesting rainwater actually is very rebellious, depending on what state you're in. In Colorado, a rain barrel is illegal. But fortunately for most states, harvesting rainwater or collecting rainwater is perfectly legal, and it can help you save a ton on your water bill, reducing your demand on conventional water sources. So with rainwater, not only are you getting your water for free, but there's some extra benefits in rainwater. 
A lot of the nitrogen available to humans is in the atmosphere. And some of this nitrogen can actually be imparted to rainwater as it falls. And your plants will actually get a little boost of nitrogen from the rainwater. Nitrogen is generally the most important nutrient for your plants. It's what's responsible for their green color. It's the major component of chlorophyll. So although some states outright ban collecting water, a lot of other local governments really promote harvesting rainwater and collecting your own rainwater. In my hometown of St. Petersburg, they actually give out rain barrels for free to encourage citizens to, to save their own water. If your local government, however, doesn't provide free rain barrels, there's an easy way to make one yourself. Today, we built one for less than $100 out of some simple materials we sourced from a local home improvement store. And we put it together in less than 10 minutes. Check it out. Most outdoor enthusiasts who love hiking and camping always bring along some food to enjoy in nature. Then there are others who are really hardcore, like my friend Craig Russell, who are a bit more adventuresome. You see, foraging or the search for wild food resources requires that you know what can and can't be eaten. Luckily, we got a tutorial from a true survivalist. I like to talk about foraging because it's almost a lost art. Uh, I can remember when I was young going out with my mother and grandmother for spring greens, there'd be lots of people out there. It was almost a social event. They'd be out in the fields gathering dandelion or winter crest. Now, when I go out for wild berries, if I see a uh, bear, it's the only company I've got. It's important, particularly if you're a novice, to be careful make sure of your identification. That's why I would recommend that you go with an experienced forager if you can. Uh, although relatively few things out there that uh, are extremely dangerous, but those that are can kill you. The uh, American Indian uh, pioneers who learned some of the food from them often in times of starvation would make use of inner barks. But to me, uh, the inner bark of pine is not a gourmet meal, but it's quite nutritious, a lot of starch, some sugars, and uh, in a survival situation, it could keep you alive. Here's some wild onions that I found. Uh, there are many species in the onion garlic family. Uh, the young growth can be used like chives. Uh, the bulbs in a few species are uh, quite tender and. Uh, pretty good, usually best as a cooked vegetable because some of them tend to be strong. This is a group of May apples here. The fruit is the only edible part of the plant. Uh, the root is actually quite poisonous, but these are buds. Uh, this plant is gonna get bigger, the 
leaves will get larger. It's been years since I had any May apple jam, which is wonderful, uh, but I actually prefer the fresh fruit. The problem is the deer, the bear, the groundhogs, the squirrels, they prefer it too and often beat us to it. Whether we're talking about hickories or walnuts or acorns, if you get to them before the uh, wildlife, nuts are, uh, in my opinion, one of the better wild foods. And uh, traditionally, actually, people have been eating nuts a lot longer than they've been eating grains. There's foraging both in a survival situation, and I think it's important if you're an outdoors person to uh, know what you can eat in an emergency. Most of the foraging I would do normally is about good eating. Hey, little guy, come here. Oh, come here, whoops. <laughs> Creative and resourceful leaders think outside the box, and that's exactly what's going on at JV Farms near Hot Springs, Arkansas. By partnering with a local brewery, as well as a popular pizzeria, Jay and Valerie Lee have created a sustainable food loop that's beneficial to everyone involved. I grew up on this farm that we're on here today. My grandparents kind of built this and put it together. We started this whole project mainly as a, uh, a way for us to get more healthy and to, and to eat better and to uh, do something on our own. And it slowly led to what we are today. You know, we get up really early, uh, we do chores, and then two days a week we go to the feed mill where we mix and grind our own feed. And then two days a week we go to farmer's market. And then Fridays we're uh, kind of here. It's our designated at the farm day so people can come here to the store and buy things. Uh, my name is Rose Schweikart and I'm the owner of the Superior Bathhouse Brewery in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. About three years ago we were selling at the farmer's market and she came up and said, hey, I'm gonna put a brew house in in a federal building downtown historic Hot Springs and everybody's like, yeah, right. Well, by George, she got it done. And the neat arrangement with us with her is that we bring all of the, the spent grains from the brew, making the mash and the brew for the, the beer back here to the farm and feed the pigs. Our brewing grains, once we're done with them, we send off to, um, to be fed to their pigs. In return, we're able to purchase uh, sausages and meats that are made from those pigs, from those pork products. Two times a week, Rose makes beer and she'll take about 500 pounds of her grains that she orders in for the beer making. And that stuff goes through its process and about three hours later, they take all of that liquid out and then we load those grains into 55 gallon tubs and then we bring it and dump it out to the pigs and let them eat them that way. You know, it's, it's a fantastic partnership for me uh, to work with JV Farms with the grain because otherwise, you know, this, this useful material here uh, which makes great pig food, it's high in protein, uh, would have to go to the landfill or you know, we would have to otherwise dispose of it. That's led to a couple of other restaurants, and namely uh, DeLuca's Pizzeria. He, he did basically the same thing about the time that Rose was, was starting her brew house. He said, I want to get some really good local pig for my, my pizzas. I, I met Jay and, uh, and Val about three years ago when we talked about it, uh, this idea of I wanted to make my own sausage. And I, it was a specific uh, fat uh, to, to meat ratio that I wanted. And they were able, uh, through time, to develop exactly what it is that I wanted. It's been really a, a unique progress for it to, to see it where it is today. I never would have thought that it would have happened this way or, or, or evolved to what it is. those folks that likes a little heat, well, you need to turn to Halafuego as a pepper. These plants are amazing in terms of the yield, and what you get are these long, smooth, delicious peppers. So with that in mind, let me share one of my favorite recipes.
Mmm. Ice cream. Who doesn't love it? It's so good, particularly in the hot summertime. Over at La Pop's Gourmet Iced Lollies, they've taken this sweet standard and added some unconventional flavors. They're really fantastic. On a family trip to Florida, we happened to cross a shop that made their own fruit pops. And I had an avocado pop. Um, my husband says I didn't get through with Popsicle before I decided I was having my own shop in Little Rock. We source locally whatever we can. So all of our strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, they just have such a better flavor. The ratio between how much syrup and fruit is super important. Part of what makes these pops so special is the texture of most of them. They're not hard or icy. It's part of one, the machine that we use, and two, the tweaking with a recipe to make sure that that ratio is on point. The mission, to some extent, is just to create a product that you probably haven't had before um, and try to do a, to combine some flavors that maybe in your mind you're saying, hey, that's not something I would do every day. We knew from the get-go we'd have to offer samples of flavors. There was no way you're gonna, you know, you can't just walk up and go, Canary melon and jalapeno pepper, this is gonna be what I want right now. It's an interesting thing to sample, try. Um, but the more we do a little funkier flavors, I mean, especially since we moved to this location, people are really more, you know, they're excited to try some stuff. We have an avocado, so, you know, people come in and when we haven't had that one in a few weeks, they're already back wanting avocado. It's gotten to be pretty common for someone to pay and immediately whip out the phone and take a picture. You know, keeping a few chickens in your backyard isn't a revolutionary idea, but the trend has certainly caught on. Keeping chickens is actually easier than you might think, but how exactly does one start their own flock? You know, this whole backyard farming thing is a lot of fun. It's amazing how many people have really caught on to the idea of growing some of their own or raising some of their own food in their backyards and uh, Bill and Susan have the goats and now they have the chickens and uh, she grows all kinds of herbs and things because they love to cook, so it's just perfect. But this is the greatest, latest addition to the backyard farm and it just looks fantastic. Thank you, we're proud of it. Yeah, it looks really good. The run is perfect. So you've got all the components. We've got the run here where they can spend the day. I love the canopy of tree cover, which will give them some shade in the summer. Bill put those wheels on the back, which will allow you to move it around. Yeah. That looks really, really good. So what we have here is, um, what are these four foot panels? Yeah, the wire's four feet wide. Yeah. And he used all treated wood for the pen. Yep, that so it'll way. last a long time. Yes, it's gonna be on the ground. Right, you know, so that's that, good. That would protect it to some extent. Yep, that's good. And then, um, so what we have here looks like uh, 12 feet by what, eight, 12 by eight, Correct. yeah. So that's almost 100 square feet. Good, but this little, I mean, this is adorable. Thank you, I think it's really cute. It's very posh. <laughs> Look at that <laughs> floor in there. It's a chicken palace. <laughs> it is. Got the, the little- Chateau Poulet. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I hope it's going to be easy to clean out. With these double doors, I thought it might be easier to get yeah, in and yeah. take care of what needs to be done. Definitely a good idea. It's very good. And um, you've got some plexiglass here, it looks like. Yeah, they slide out for um, inclement weather. And in the winter, we'll keep those in. And then in the summer, we'll take them out so they'll yeah, have some so more ventilation. Ventilates well. Yep. Now, the only thing that you might want to add, you've got your nest boxes back here. Yep. And uh, you and Bill may want to just put one of these little boards across so the eggs don't roll out. And then uh, probably you'll need a little roost pole uh, that'll I'd get it as high as you can across here. Okay. And you may need two if you add some more chickens. Okay, Before, just side by side? Uh, side by side, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and I wouldn't worry, as long as they, they're let out early in the morning and they get locked up at night, then I wouldn't worry about having feed and water up here. I just let this be for egg laying and sleeping. Okay. Yeah, Perfect. very good. Yeah, it's, it's really super. Thanks.
You know, you have to work through the city ordinances. Every city is different. Every township is different. So um, some don't allow animals like this in the backyards at all. Others have loosened up their um, ordinances in the last few years because there's been such pressure from the public to be able to have these sorts of things in their backyards. I think it's a great thing. Of course, most cities won't let you have a rooster, so it was important when um, I helped Susan out with the chickens that we let them get old enough where we could tell whether they were going to be roosters or hens, and so she has all little pullets or all little females. Because in this particular township, you can have some hens, but you can't have roosters. I know some of you out there are raising chickens in your backyard. If so, I'd love to hear about it. Thomas Jefferson said, a little rebellion now and then is a good thing. And I have to say, I agree. So whatever your cause may be, just remember, think outside the box. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith.